A paraesophageal hernia is not the same thing as acid reflux disease and is a bigger deal. People with acid reflux can have major complications, but usually not. Patients with a paraesophageal hernia have a 1% chance per year of an emergency arising. And when that emergency arises, the mortality rate is very high. The high mortality rate associated with paraesophageal hernias is a reflection of who gets paraesophageal hernias. Paraesophageal hernias are generally in patients over the age of 65, frequently 80 and 90 years of age. And with a paraesophageal hernia, if something goes wrong, it can be a major problem. A paraesophageal hernia is a hiatal hernia that has gotten out of control. It's normal for women, after they've been pregnant, to have a hiatal hernia. It's normal for pot-bellied men to have a hiatal hernia. That's just a normal stretch out that goes on. Maybe it's not normal to have a pot belly. But in um, any case, this area gets stretched out and allows the stomach to come up into the chest. And a small hiatal hernia isn't a big deal. With a paraesophageal hernia, that enlargement that should be about that big gets larger and larger and will get this big and allow the entire stomach to come up into the chest or a large proportion of the stomach and even the colon and it can drag the pancreas up into the chest and that abnormal anatomy results in problems. So all of the stuff in this area can migrate up into the chest and it does so because the chest is a billows action. You take a deep breath, you're generating negative pressure and sucking air in through your mouth. But if you do take a deep breath, you're also, with a hiatal hernia, sucking more stomach up into the chest. As that happens, you end up with more and more stomach in the chest, occupying space in the chest, and resulting in various problems. People with a parasophageal hernia may not know that they have a problem. They may have no symptoms whatsoever. They may have had their heartburn completely disappear. They've had heartburn for many years sometimes. Patients with a paraesophageal hernia frequently will have their stomach rotated like counterclockwise up into the chest and upside down kinking the anti-reflux valve and therefore they no longer have heartburn and regurgitation. They may have disappeared on them five, 10 years ago, uh, and the stomach just twists up there. That can result in a lot of gas trapping in the chest, a lot of burping to get pressure out of the chest. It can result in difficulty swallowing because things are twisted here. Sometimes it results in bleeding because the stomach is twisted up into its uh, uh, abnormal position in the chest, resulting in ulceration. And many times people with a paraesophageal hernia have been anemic for years. They've been given iron, blood transfusions. They've been scoped high and low looking for causes of the, of the bleeding. And the, the, the anemia is their main problem. They are just short of breath because their blood count is so low. And then they get their blood transfusion. They find they're still short of breath because so much space, the size of a, a, you know, a, a large um, grapefruit, is in their chest, occupied by their stomach, preventing their lungs from functioning well. So many of those uh, symptoms can occur, but when a parasophageal hernia is found, the question is, you know, should you live with this or not? If a patient is very elderly and can't stand an operation, that's the way it is. If, however, they're young and dynamic and are having a lot of symptoms, they really should have it repaired. The more symptoms you're having, the greater the chance of an emergency. The emergencies that can arise with a paraesophageal hernia include obstruction, so you simply can't swallow, uh, massive bleeding, which is usually painless and exsanguinating, and precipitating an emergency surgery, uh, twisting of the stomach in the chest so that the stomach actually dies. And I've had patients where two-thirds of their stomach is dead in the chest by the time they got to an operating room. And then you gotta take the dead stomach out of the chest abdomen operation in somebody that's elderly and, and the mortality rate's really high with that. When a parasophageal hernia is encountered, 
there's a philosophical decision that needs to be made. Should we take the risk of fixing this or should we take uh, observation status? In general, for a 70-year-old with a parasophageal hernia, the chances of mortality with the operation are about 1%. For an 80-year-old, it's about 3%. For a 90-year-old, it's about 9%. So there is, a, is a, a diminishing return with getting more elderly with whether the operation should be undertaken. And there are 60-year-olds with bad hearts and blood, you know, heart failure that shouldn't have this operation either if it's, if it's encountered. Uh, but that discussion needs to be had with the surgeon, sometimes getting a cardiologist or their pulmonary doctor involved in planning out the pathway for a safe operation. The operation is usually done in the hospital. It's usually gonna be done uh, with a, a two to three hour operation. And it's gonna uh, usually involve some hospitalization uh, because it's a painful operation. It's done laparoscopically with five incisions in the upper abdomen that allow us to work in the chest. The stomach is in the chest behind the heart, and uh, most of the pain is felt between the shoulder blades up uh, in, the, in the chest. And uh, with the operation, the first part is pulling the stomach down out of the chest, exposing the hiatus, which frequently is this big, and will take six to ten stitches to fix bringing those muscles together again to a position where they haven't been many times since uh, uh, the patient was 30 years old. Uh, and that stretch on the diaphragm feels like pain and it makes it hard to breathe and pneumonia is a, a common complication of this operation if they're not encouraged to deep breathe and cough and walk and keep their lungs functioning. Part of what they're wanting to do is get those lungs re-expanded to occupy that space where the stomach used to be up in the chest. Uh, so frequently it's a two to three night hospitalization, controlling the pain, working with the breathing, also working with swallowing because a greater section of the esophagus is involved in the dissection to get the stomach down back where it belongs and this is gonna be swollen and be difficult to swallow. So in the hospital, they'll be on a liquid diet and probably be on a liquid diet for a week or two, sometimes three afterwards, depending on how weak their esophagus is before surgery. So a parasophageal hernia repair needs to be thought through carefully in conjunction with the other medical doctors on the team, uh, usually done in a hospital setting with an anticipated recovery of a couple of months, during which time Energy is lower, the caloric intake will be less, and they're going to be wanting to increase their activities more and more and more slowly through the recovery phase. But for most parasophageal hernia patients, it is advised that they undergo that operation, and really, they need an experienced surgeon doing it. These operations can be done with a robot in the hospital, my preference is to do them laparoscopically, uh, and I've got 20 years of experience, 25 years of experience uh, doing them. And it's one of my most challenging and, and rewarding operations because I'm operating on vulnerable patients, getting them through safely in uh, difficult anatomical terrain, um, and restoring their anatomy again. Okay, now I've got a really unpopular subject and that is complications after surgery. All surgeries have potential complications. Some surgeries have different complications from others, but there are some that need to be watched out with every operation. One of those are things that people naturally are afraid of and that's bleeding. Uh, for most operations, the risk of bleeding is relatively low, amounts to bruising, and rarely results in transfusion. If you have religious objections to uh, blood products, be sure and let your uh, a surgeon know about that. But rarely do we need to proceed on with any bleeding trans transfusion sort of issues in general surgery and the stuff that I'm, I'm generally doing. But there are a few things that can increase your risk of bleeding that you need to be, be aware of. 
aspirin increases bleeding, it increases bruising substantially, and unless your doctor feels like you need to be on aspirin despite the fact that you're having surgery, most patients will be taken off of aspirin. Uh, likewise, ibuprofen, Aleve, any of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories also have the same effect on clotting. So we'll generally have people off of those medications for a few days before surgery. External bleeding is very obvious. If you've got a spot of blood this big on your dressing, it's probably going to stop on its own. If your dressing, however, is soaked and looks like it's continuing, you need to notify your surgeon right away. Frequently that will get better just by applying pressure. But if it doesn't, it will need to be addressed during a, a close time frame there. Don't be polite to your surgeon. I like that if you are, but don't wait till morning if you've been bleeding all night. That can be a, a real problem. And uh, uh, let the surgeon know if you're soaking your dressings. The other way that you know you have bleeding uh, is something you might not think of up front. For most operations, we want you up and around the house the night of surgery. And walking is good, it prevents blood clots, it keeps you mobile, uh, but it also gives us an early warning sign. If you're attempting to walk the night of surgery and you're pale and you're passing out, that's either a heart problem or that's internal bleeding. That's an automatic trip to the emergency room and Nobody should talk you into going to bed because you're dehydrated, you just need to rest. If you're pale and passing out, or just passing out, period, when you try and walk, that's internal bleeding and needs to be evaluated that night. Call 911, call me on the way. Infections are also a, 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 a risk with surgery, and anytime the intestines are cut across, there's a higher risk of infection. Um, Wound infections are not common at Meridian Surgery Center. The risk is about 1%. If your um, inf a wound is red and angry, if it's draining pussy stuff, if you're having a fever over 101, those infections uh, symptoms are generally going to occur in the first week to three weeks after surgery. Uh, it's a nuisance. It might scare you, but it's probably not an emergency that requires an emergency room visit. And if you go to the emergency room, you're going to be there 10 hours. Um, call on the surgeon. Texting a picture is the better way to do it, way faster, way cheaper, and will save you a lot of trouble. I had a patient two years ago who was pacing in the emergency room with this problem. He'd been there four and a half hours. He was getting really mad. Other people were going ahead of him. He wasn't getting any attention. And he just went... <sighs> I'm supposed to be calling Dr. Wright. What am I doing here? Um, and we had it all, all figured out for him within 15 minutes. So um, be aware the emergency room isn't generally the place for that kind of a problem. Let's get it taken care of. Anesthesia-wise, uh, your operation generally involves anesthesia. Local anesthetic has very minimal risks, but if you're allergic to lidocaine or bupivacaine in the dental office, we need to know that because that's what we're generally using, something related to that. Uh, general anesthetic and sedation procedures have uh, risk of anesthesia as well. Uh, we're generally evaluating that in the clinic as we go along with the surgery evaluation, and patients with high risk are generally done in the hospital setting. Patients with intermediate risks and low risks are in this out outpatient setting. But that's part of why we're doing blood tests and EKGs in evaluation before surgery. And sometimes you'll be set up for an outpatient surgery and those tests will either cancel the surgery and require a cardiac evaluation or change the setting of the surgery uh, or tell us something else needs to be done before the operation is done. But we deal with, uh, uh, in the outpatient setting, minimizing the anesthetic risk and getting you through the operation as smooth as possible. You'll be speaking with the anesthesia provider specifically about your situation the day of surgery before you go in for surgery. If you have sleep apnea at baseline, we do ask you to bring in your CPAP mask because that can be helpful in the recovery phase when you're not breathing so well and when you're not, not as awake, uh, sort of like it helps you at night. 
Medications that we give after surgery can have reactions too, particularly if you've never seen them before. If you've had problems with certain pain pills before, we need to know that up front uh, so that we don't get you into the same trouble that you had before. But generally, narcotic pain medications are constipating. And the number one distress call I get uh, is usually four days after surgery. Somebody hasn't thought about how their bowels are working. They've had their surgery. They're doing okay. But now they can't poop. And it can be the most miserable part of your operation if you're bloated after an abdominal surgery and you can't poop and you can't, you have to push it out and nobody wants to give you an enema. Um, so you need to be proactive on that. So the night of surgery, drink plenty of liquids. When you're starting to eat, don't jump into meat and potatoes. Instead, fruit and vegetables. You want lots of fiber in your diet that will help you with your bowels in that immediate post-operative period. And if you're a constipated person in the first place, clean out before surgery, take laxatives, and keep your bowels working. You would rather have the trots in two days than bricks in four. But certainly keep an eye on it. If you normally have really good bowels, you don't even have to think about it, be thinking about it. If you haven't had a bowel movement in two days, you need to take a laxative and get things going and make sure that you don't get bound up. That's the best way to have a smooth operation after the operation. So when it comes to complications, nobody can tell you all the possible complications. There are a number of things that can go wrong. Your uh, informed consent forms will give you um, uh, a lot of answers there. Uh, but generally speaking, the more experienced your surgeon is, the less complications you're gonna have because they've seen things before and that experience helps them keep their patients uh, safe. Uh, so at Meridian Surgery Center, uh, you'll see a lot of experienced surgeons and providers uh, at your bedside uh, guiding you through your operation to minimize your potential for infection.